Hello, and welcome to season four, episode two of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Thank you for joining us today and for taking that first step to grow personally and professionally. I would like to ask everyone who has a camera and able to turn it on and listen with intention. We have a an exciting guest today. And today is about sharing and connecting creativity, innovation, maybe even entrepreneurship to an organization. Much like we teach in the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program, which is unique compared to any other program at USF. And we focus on three main pillars. One, to develop students to create their own business. If you walk down downtown St. Pete, downtown Tampa, you will see a range of businesses started by alumni from this program. Tech, pizza, coffee, bars, clubs, you name it. Secondly, we develop students become entrepreneurs or innovators within a firm. All the products we buy, all the service we use, are monitored, created, and managed by someone using the same skills that we teach in the program. And I have about 15 to 20 students who work at Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, you name it. And lastly, possibly the most important, we develop students to define careers themselves, not what others define for them which is what most programs do. And I have several students doing just that, launching their music career, being social media influencers, creating careers that don't exist and leaving a trail of breadcrumbs to follow. Today's guest is doing just that with her organization. A true master of puppets, a phenomenal executive who works with precision, at the same time balances the endless demands of a creative organization. She has a range of leadership experiences stemming from the Home Shopping Network, Tervis Tumblr, someone who I deeply look up to as a leader. Tampa Bay is lucky to have you. Please give a warm welcome to Chief Operating Officer at the Dali Museum, Kathy Greif. Please give a warm welcome, and this is how we do this with our mics off and sign language. So Kathy, welcome. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday morning. Where does this cast find you, and can you bring us up to on the speed on what you've been working on? Sure, thanks so much for having me. That was a very warm welcome. I really appreciate it. Um, today I am at home, which is kind of a temporary home. I'm building a house, so we're uh, living with a good friend who was gracious to let us stay with him while the home is finished because it's been on a constant delay, uh, like the rest of the world with with everything related to shipping and things like that. So um, any day now, we're supposed to move in next week. So uh, I am at my friend's house and I'll be heading into the Dali as soon as we uh, get off this call to uh, continue the rest of my work day. And uh, regarding what I've been working on, uh, very recently we introduced uh, our Picasso the, and the Allure of the South exhibit. And so pretty much every time we do an exhibit, I uh, help to kind of lead the, the process. Um, everybody at the organization is involved in uh, curating and, and educating and interpreting and marketing and welcoming visitors to an exhibit. So it takes um, virtually every role in the museum. And I help to orchestrate that. And I uh, also lead our digital efforts. So within the Picasso exhibit, which I hope you'll all come to see, is an experience that we created called Your Portrait, which transforms your selfie into a cubist work of art. So you can see what you look like at, uh, if someone like Picasso uh, were to paint you, which is really fun. 
you suddenly threw in, you orchestrate all of the marketing, recruitment, organization, and that's largely what we'll be talking about because that's something that I feel that you do so well and you're going to shed some light on we as students and in the audience. I'm curious to know a bit about your background and your work experience and how maybe you developed into this COO level, because this is not something that happens overnight or you roll out of bed and you find yourself. So how did this translate in your career? Yeah, I, I never had aspirations to be a COO. I don't think it ever crossed my mind. Uh, but when I, I really always wanted to be um, a creative director and that's what I went to school for. I went to the University of Florida. I majored in advertising. When I got out of school, I worked for a medium to large size uh, company, a, a mortgage company in Jacksonville. I worked in the marketing department and my role was largely graphic design and copywriting. And that was what I wanted to do. And I was, um, I'm gonna really date myself here, but it was the late nineties and the internet was just becoming a thing and uh, or e-commerce in particular was and they needed somebody to help um, lead the creation of the first website uh, both B2B and B2C and I was tapped at, at like 23 to, to help with that and because nobody at the time really knew what they were doing anyway with regard to all of that so um, so I was really lucky I was in a good position to 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 be in at the time work started working on kind of the internet at that time and um website creation not on the development side but on the front end i moved to i wanted to move to a a, a larger city and so i moved to, to washington dc i had a very short stint at a uh, lobbyist there which i i realized was not for me i uh because I worked in the mortgage industry, was able to get into Fannie Mae, and that's one of uh, that's the leader in the mortgage industry, uh, Fortune 500 company, really large company. Was able to learn a ton there, and uh, so. But I worked on the websites there, and then I realized that I really wasn't uh, passionate, if you will, about finance and mortgages. And so I wanted to work uh, it's somewhere sexier, honestly. And in DC, there's a lot of, you know, it's a big city, so there's a lot of companies, but there are a lot of like politics and this and that, and kind of like the ultimate place to work in DC, at least at the time, because they're not headquartered there any longer, but um, was Discovery Communications. So Discovery Channel, and TLC, and Animal Planet, and all of those. Um, and again, I got really lucky, I feel like, or I interviewed well, I don't know what, but I got a job there and I spent about five years working there and I really loved it. They were an incredibly creative company, very entrepreneurial. They're, you know, the CEO of the company that was the founder at the time that I worked there, John Hendricks, you know, he was 22 years old, University of Maryland student and created and launched the Discovery Channel from like the basement of his parents' home in Maryland. And uh, so he was, um, you know, just talk about an icon to look up to. Um, so that was a, a great company to work for. Uh, like I said, I stayed there about five years. I worked on all things kind of front end and started getting into more marketing. I was responsible for some of the marketing of the e-commerce website throughout the networks. Um, so it was, Discovery owned like 120 networks at the time. So it was a lot of different uh, coordination uh, and and creative work. So the time of like, you know, I was 2006, 2007, I wanted to move back to Florida just for personal reasons, wanted to be closer to my family. And uh, they had all migrated here to the Tampa Bay area. So I was in e-commerce at the time, who better to go work for than HSN, who was uh, one of the top 10 e-commerce sites in the country, and they were headquartered here. So it was a perfect fit. I came down here and I worked as uh, the director of content 
for uh, HSN. And within about a year or so, my boss's boss got tapped to uh, head up not only e-commerce, but all of marketing and the creative for the, the company. And he asked me if I wanted to give it a go as the director of brand marketing. Now, oh, I had not done uh, any marketing really specifically. Now, if you hearken back, I had majored in advertising. I had been doing things all relatively similar, um, but not as much on the strategy side. So it was an incredible opportunity and a perfect way to start uh, taking my career in a different direction. So I worked there another four years as the director of brand marketing and uh I mean, I learned an incredible amount. There were so many talented people there. It was a very fast paced business. And then I went to be the vice president of marketing for Tervis, which is located in um, Venice or the Sarasota area. I really wanted to work for, at that point, I had been working for at HSN, which is like a house of brands. And I really wanted to kind of hone that into like one brand to market and really know everything about your consumer and and really kind of be more focused. So that was a good fit. Um, I only stayed there two years because I kind of started to realize I wanted to do something more for the world. I had been working kind of in a consumer centric environment a lot. It, there's nothing wrong with it. I learned a lot. Um, I I found it really interesting for the, that 20 or so years of my career, but I just wanted to do more for the world. And uh, it was going to take a sabbatical and kind of figure it out. Um, but on like about 12 hours into my sabbatical, I heard uh, about the Dolly's uh, opening for at the time a marketing lead. And I couldn't pass it up because if I was going to do something for the world uh, and I was pretty passionate about the Tampa Bay area and thinking it was just remarkable. And uh, the Dolly is the, the gem of the Tampa Bay area. So I just couldn't pass up the opportunity. So I did not uh, take a sabbatical and I went to work for the Dolly and uh, about Four and a half, five years ago, about three or four years into my marketing role there, um, I became the COO. And it really, that was, that's a, like a huge jump. It sounds like a huge jump, but there's so much strategy in marketing in understanding your consumer and the market, and what people want. And that is really what my role as the COO is, is to drive strategy for the organization and to ensure that all of the departments are aligned and working toward the same goal. So there really is a lot of synergy between marketing and, um, and operations. So it's been, uh, it's been a real joy. I think there's a lot of unique nuggets that we can learn from your brief summary of your, um, work experience. And what I'm hearing is there was a lot of intention about where you were going to go next or what activities we're going to learn at each. And that's something that I want to highlight to our students and our audience because you were very, very much intentional because one, you had to know yourself to know what you might be interested in or what companies you are gravitating to in terms of their mission, how they contribute to society. And these are important things. So we can be, many of you guys are going to be graduating soon, and it's not just take any job. You have to resonate with that company. You have to understand how you're going to build those toolkits or the experiences that you're going to have and realizing you need to be just as strategic with your career as you are whatever working for that company and, and implementing their strategy or whatever aspect of their strategies. So these are wonderful examples. That means you have to really be aware of what you want, what you know, and and be forward thinking. At least that's what I'm hearing you say, Kathy, because that helped you craft your journey to be able to go from one step to the next. Is is that that's, fair to say? Yeah, I think that's really fair. I I would add to it though that I didn't know like long term any of this. It was, you know, kind of in the moment Am I happy with what I'm doing? What don't I like about it? What would I want to do differently? 
you know, either with my role or with my leadership or with the mission of the organization or the product and services they offer. And um, yeah, so it's, you know, definitely good to be introspective and figure that out. Like I, I wasn't one of the, those types of people who say, well, ultimately I want to be here. And so I'm going to do this next and then this and then this and then this, that I didn't, I didn't do, I, I did focus on what's next. And, you know, am I currently happy? And if not, why? And then, you know, what could make me happy? And, uh, you know, I, I did have times where I took a job. I mean, I, I mentioned um, when I wanted to move to DC, I uh, didn't have a ton of connections. And the one connection I had got me into this uh, lobbying group uh, for an interview. I got the job you know, I mean, I was offered the job right away without having to think about it too much. And I, I did take it to take a job to get to DC. So that was intentional. Um, I didn't like the job and uh, a lot of things about it. So I, I really quickly did, you know, uh, hit the door there. But, uh, you know, so sometimes I think it's okay to take kind of a little bit of a leap or something away from what, you know, if it, if you think it's going to lead you back. But I, I would say that every other position and company I chose was based on a lot of uh, introspection on like, what's going to make me happy? What do I want my next move to be? Wonderful. I'm not sure we teach that all that much in, in the university. Uh, setting, but these are wise words. Right now, you're leading the Dali. What challenges do you face as a leader um, growing the Dali or working for a non for profit that's different than the other experiences that you've had? Well, I mean, a lot of times I like to say that working for a non profit is, has a lot of similarities with working for a for profit company in terms of. You know, you have a lot of different departments, you have goals, you are trying to hit those, you have a lot of different people, a lot of different personalities, a lot of different strengths that you're all, you know, trying to, to work toward. I think as if you are setting a really clear goal of what you're trying to achieve, then, you know, they're, they're really quite similar in terms of for-profit and non-profit. Obviously, the key difference is that when you work for a for-profit for company, uh, the money can come back to individuals, um, you know, and st shareholders or, you know, things like that. Whereas in a non non-profit or not-for-profit, the money is invested back uh, toward the mission. And that is important to me, um, you know, in terms of I always feel like what we're doing is making a difference. So we, you know, we're very mission oriented. I, I think most, you know, healthy not for profits would be, you have to be, um, you have a board that, you know, is monitoring what you're doing and you have to make sure that you're, you're meeting your donors expectations as well. So it's always mission first. Um, and that, that is a, you know, really critical part of what we're doing, but at the same time, you know, you can't run a not for profit and not make any money. So you're still very business oriented in terms of what are our revenue drivers? How do we keep this thing afloat? And and so I think I think they're just like mostly similar other than kind of at the heart what the what, you know, the goal is and, and where the money goes at the end of the day. Would you say you have to be even more creative with your business model as a result of the type of arts business that you are or creative business that you are? And does that mean you have to be more innovative, entrepreneurial, because you're not selling just widgets? Stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I, I mean, I love not selling stuff. Um, I mean, I like stuff sometimes too, but you know, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's you know, I'm sure there's a lot of materialism in the world, and you know, so working for somebody who's not just selling stuff is is uh, really important to me. I mean, that was one of the reasons that I loved working for Discovery as well, is that it was you know about educating and entertaining, and that's really 
what we're doing at the Dali. We're educating and we're entertaining. Um, in terms of having to be more creative, you know, I, I guess I wouldn't give myself or any of us that much credit. I mean, I think we have in in business and you have to be creative all the time. You have problems that you have to solve and that takes an incredible amount of creativity. And then you have opportunities that you want to seize and that takes creativity. So, I mean, you know, through the pandemic, obviously we had challenges that, uh, you know, some organizations didn't have, but obviously many organizations and many people had tons of challenges and still have challenges uh, making our way through this. But um, outside of that, you know, uh, I think a any business, any organization is going to have uh, a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities and you were just working toward them toward, you know, uh, toward your goal, you know, capitalizing on any of the ones that that help you reach your goals. One of the things I enjoy learning from you the most is how when you came on to the Dali, we know that Salvador Dali has a name and we know that, you know, other companies may have different brands. What was the state of, we'll say, the brand of the Dali Museum when you arrived? And how would you say it's changed? Because I know that's playing a bigger impact when I engage with the various ways uh, the Dali Museum engages with society. That is, um, man, we could talk for endless hours about that alone. But brand is something I'm super passionate about. I think it's really um, key to a lot of success in businesses and you're right that like Dali Salvador Dali had you know he was an artist and he definitely had a brand I mean he was one of actually the first artists maybe the artist to really coin brand as an artist you know I mean he had a persona that is quite different from who his actual personality you know was but um so but Salvador Dali was the man the artist and the Dali Museum, while we're here to kind of, um, you know, preserve his legacy, conserve and preserve his art and use all of his art and uh, and his life to inspire others, um, we are not Salvador Dali. So a lot of the work that I, and, and I don't know that that was all that clear when I, when I got there. So that was one of the really fundamental things that I worked on when I initially got to the museum was um, creating an identity for the Dali Museum that was um, inspired by Salvador Dali, but different than the man, the artist, and kind of really establishing who we are and kind of teaching throughout the organization the importance of brand and how that impacts everything you do it is not just some colors of your logo and and you know how your advertising looks it is it is everything it is what you invest in it is the programs you put on it is you know how you, what your core values are you know so we had to establish all of that you know brand positioning and um we had a mission statement but we wrote a vision statement and, a, and we wrote a positioning statement and we defined our core values and, you know, kind of developed an entire uh, brand guideline that for, you know, the last eight and a half, nine years we've been, we're still, you know, evolving and working on kind of getting the entire organization to fully understand um, and, and leverage the brand that we've created. It's wonderful that you share it. We think, or at least educate students in the sense, you have this brand or this identity and these missions and vision, and then everyone just follows it and <laughs> everyone knows it and everyone just goes along and supports it. But what you're sharing is the organization, the Dali Museum didn't necessarily have a, 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 a strong enough grip on this concept and this idea and what the importance of it. And one of the value that you brought was to execute it and then educate the employees and the people around who are in, in stakeholders or influenced by it to why it's so important to the ethos and arguably uh, a tool of how to make decisions for the organization. Is that fair? 
That's that's incredibly perfectly said in terms of how to make decisions. That that is what brand is. It is your guidepost on how to make decisions. And brand is one of those kind of I think it's just like really elusive to a lot of people. I will tell you, I have never worked with more talented people in my life at, than I work with at the Dali. But we all have very different talents and strengths. And I could work, I, I, I mean, I'm one employee, you know, I've worked with for the whole time I've been there, one of the smartest people I know, hands down, so incredibly knowledgeable about art and about Dali and about music and things that are just like not part of, of my knowledge base. Um, and also a, a smart, intelligent, logical kind of person. But this person's grasp of brand is still after eight and a half years, like, so, but brand is colors, right? And I'm like, ah, you're killing me. Um, and, you know, I, I, unlike you, am not a teacher. So I have not, you know, figured out, honestly, how to really get everybody to understand it. But I think it's just one of those things some people get it and some people don't. And that's why some people are in brand marketing and some people aren't. <laughs> so, I mean, it is important for everybody to understand why brand is important. Um, will they all totally um, get on board and be able to use it the same way? Not necessarily. So, you know, I think that's why there's different departments and different uh, types of personalities and everything at an organization, you know, you all just work together and, and, but anyway, I, I honestly have not solved it. <laughs> if you figure it out, if anybody on this call can figure it out, I would love, I would love to know. Side tip for those who are starting or have their own business. This is why having these concepts, mission, vision, brand, and the ethos well understood because this will be your guidepost going forward in the decisions that you're going to make. I know that, Kathy, that uh, research plays a big role in building strategy and uh, the your tenure at the DALI. St research is uh, something that I embed in a lot of my classes and I emphasize the importance of it. How does research play a role in, in the DALI strategy or, or in all the aspects of, of the operation? Research is, you know, critical to marketing. Um, it's critical to strategy, and it is one of the other um, big things that I tried to introduce more of at the Dolly when I got here. We do everything from market research, so identifying, you know, who our audience is, what's motivating them to visit, what, you know, uh, what. Then we do visitor experience kind of things, which is looking at our actual visitors while they're on site. So what's working and not, we do ad hoc research on uh, our exhibits or digital experiences. And we're trying to learn more about what's working or not and how we would want to optimize those things. You know, and research gives you both point in time information in terms of, you know, I, I'm, I need to know this about uh, that. And it also lets you track your progress over time to make sure you're always improving. So it's sort of like a, you know, a gut check to make sure you're not faltering in certain areas and that things that you were trying to focus on improving are actually moving uh, that direction. And uh, it, it also tells you things that you can't know, you know, when you're guessing and making assumptions, you know, you know, the definition of assumptions is, you know, what happens. So um, it researches science. It's factual information. Well, providing that you've done it the right way. You know, you can't do a, a study of, uh, you know, a survey of 10 people and then say, well, 10, you know, eight people said this. But, you know, when you get into the, I mean, I always use the 300 as being kind of a statistically significant number. And, you know, usually when we're doing our market studies, we're, um, you know, talking about thousands of people and our visitor experience studies, we're looking at thousands of people. So unless you're doing, you know, like a focus group or something like where you're really trying to kind of interview people, um, which we've done periodically for a few things, but largely we're talking about, you know, 
large uh, amounts of people so we can get statistically significant information. And it drives every, I mean, everything we do. When we're thinking about uh, making major changes, we and you know are, are surveying people and uh, when, and then like I said, we have ongoing studies so that we can really track our progress. Wonderful. I hope the students who are taking my scalability and student consulting design thinking are listening because there's a reason why I have half the semester based off of research because ultimately this is the gut check. This is some of the credibility that enable you to make decisions that tie to your ethos and your brand. And regardless if it's a big organization, a smaller organization, a new organization, it's constantly getting that feedback from that broader stakeholder community users, customers, whatever. So this is why we embed that in our courses. And thank you for enlightening us, Kathy, with the importance of that. Sure. I know that DALI, which we might think of as a museum, but it's really so much more tech, innovation. I'm wondering how that transpired or is that a, uh, how did you move in terms of strategy to, or to position yourself like that? And what are the challenges when you do that or why did you do that? Yeah, a um, couple of things in there. So, well, Dali was an innovator. Um, he likened himself to be an inventor and he was really fascinated with science and technology. So it was really natural for us to go there. So, uh, you know, then at, at the same time, you know, that, that was always like a base. Um, so, like I said, everything we do is inspired by by Dali, and luckily he was involved in so many things. It gives us a lot of wings. But also around, you know, around the time I got there, I guess a, a lot of it was evolving. But one in particular moment happened. We were doing an Andy Warhol exhibition. And we had been uh, collaborating with the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. It's a single artist museum dedicated to Warhol, like we are a single artist museum dedicated to Dali. And they had developed this um, digital experience where you would, the visitor would sit down. It was based on something Warhol did in his uh, factory, which uh, he had in New York City. And, and he would film people with a certain type of uh, camera that created a really slow moving clip. You'd end up with this five minute clip. It was really interesting. He actually did Dali. So we had that in the exhibit of all these different celebrities that he had um, created this work of art with. They created the Warhol Museum had uh, kind of replicated it, um, basically took your photo and slowed it down and then you got it emailed to you. Um, and we we borrowed that as part of the exhibit that we put on and we saw that people were pretty engaged with it and it was the first time we had put something digital like that into an exhibition and meanwhile we were working on something um with uh, a group out in san francisco that we've developed a lot of our um digital experiences with goodby silverstein and partners and so at the same time, we were kind of thinking this was something interesting and we had this opportunity to put something digital in an ex exhibit. So by the time we introduced ours, we had some inform our experience, we had some information information about the people's digital in, in interest in digital experiences as part of an exhibition. I know it sounds crazy because now there's all these digital immersive exhibits and all of this, but the amount of time that this industry has moved from having really nothing digital, you have, you know, two, two D or three dimensional objects, but you know, art in an exhibit to where we are now to where we have fully digital exhibits is we're talking about an, a span of like eight years and the whole industry has kind of radically changed. And we are really proud that we've been at the forefront of that. We've been introducing these things for the last eight years. And with that, we've continued to study the behavior. So back to research and see how many people are interested in these things. I, I tell this story when we first were thinking about this type of thing. One of our curators, I had I had been talking about an area of the gallery where we could on a wall put like a hashtag for whatever the exhibit was at the time. And, and the curator was like, ugh, 
you and your hashtags and she's like wiping them out of the air like just to get rid of them you know because I was I am not you know an art historian and I was this you know marketer kind of coming in and maybe you know blasphemizing this purity of of um, a gallery experience and um but everybody at the museum now I can tell you would not be wiping hashtags out of the air because user visitors the market the audience wants this stuff they want to be part of the art they want to see the original art they want to understand the talent and the you know incredible innovation and creativity that went into that but they want to experience it too i mean that's just what you know the internet and social media and everything has driven us all to want i mean we we want to immerse ourselves we want to figure out what it means to us and it's it's just furthering the educational mission that we have uh, by really deeply immersing people into it. So I, it's really, it's it's evolved, but pretty much every exhibit we do, or even just for the museum itself, you know, we've introduced Dolly Lives, which is an AI experience that brings Salvador Dali back to life. Um, and, you know, we have VR, which uh, an award winning experience that we created called Dreams of Dali that lets you go inside a painting. And like I said at the beginning of our talk here, um, we just introduced this uh, kind of just fun uh, element called your portrait, which um, turns your selfie into a cubist portrait. And we are planning to create additional versions of that so people can understand um, different types of art styles. So it's always got an educational element, but it is also intended to be engaging and fun and entertaining too. And it's been a, a whirlwind because it's it's not been a lot of time, like I said, since we've made this major transformation, not only at the DALI, but the industry as a whole. I love all those examples that you shared. You talked about innovation on the macro level. We talk about that in, uh, at least two of our courses there was a trend happening people wanting experiences either differently than just a traditional museum plus the advent of technology which is exactly what we talk about in creativity and innovation and you said how do we get on board then you said we're going to develop and was over time these different types of products or experiences and services those are forms of innovation for the DALI and that could relate to other organizations as well. But so you could see how Kathy and her team has had innovate, even if they're not whatever it means to be an entrepreneur or they have to be innovative, certainly within the organization. This is a perfect example of why the role of entrepreneurship and innovation is much more expansive and applies to any type of organization. And these are perfect examples. And then the third great point that you made was, we can have these great ideas, that doesn't mean everyone in an organization is going to accept them. And this is why we come back to storytelling and innovation, the importance of tying it broad, broader to the ethos, how you understand you relate and compare to your other competitors. So when Kathy said, what about the hashtag? And they say, no, erase, erase, erase. She had to use her persuasion and create a vision to why we need to move in this type of direction and how it's going to ben benefit and tied to our broader ethos and our brand. So we can start seeing the same tools we're learning in class are applying, being applied by Kathy and her organization. Wonderful examples, thank you. I would like to prime the students for the questions they had. Maybe is what is a digital experience if you're a dentist, a digital experience if you're big into the MLB, a digital experience if you're big into veteran support or um dance and those are the people that i'm picking out because uh, i know that you guys have your your side hustles and your businesses going but i would like to prime what questions might you have for kathy and i'm going to ask her one question and then uh so you have some time to think about it there's another level of innovation that i know that you're doing that either is not well understood in our society or overlooked and this is the role of kind of innovation and leadership or in organizational innovation. And I know you're doing something wonderful organizationally that most organizations don't do. And maybe the students are not even aware, some few organizations are doing. And that's the role of 
we'll say, uh, talent management or providing opportunities internally. Can you share a bit about how you're innovating with your management and your leadership? Sure. Um, you know, we're a fairly small organization with around 85 employees. So, you know, when you're working for like some of the big companies that I worked for or even bigger companies, there's all sorts of, of ability to kind of move up the ladder or move to different departments. And um, I mean, we have certainly some of that within our organization, but in order to keep people really uh, engaged and to retain employees, we developed a program recently. Um, well, it took us a while to develop, um, but we introduced it recently, which is about um, cross training. And it really is, it's, it's helpful to the individual and it's helpful to the organization. So it's, you know, your stereotypical win-win. Um, what we have done is ask all of the departments to identify projects or, you know, kind of tasks and responsibilities that they could use help on from somebody outside of their department. And then we make those available to the whole organization to apply for. Um, so if somebody is a graphic designer, but they're working in our store, um, we might have a graphic design project or even something that is ongoing that they could work on, um, you know, every now and then. Might have, um, we do have, I, I'll probably use a lot of um, artistic related uh, examples because we do have a lot of artists, talented artists at the organization. You don't find yourself at the Dolly all that often if you're not at least interested in in art to some degree. So we do have a lot of talented painters and um, sculptors and photographers and graphic designers and things like that. So there are a lot of opportunities like that, but there are things like research. Um, you know, we do a lot of research on, on artists and on Dali himself. Um, we are, you know, a scholarly organization. So there are tons of research opportunities um, within the curatorial department. There are things like hanging paintings. I mean, you have to be really trained for that but a lot of times we need even just extra hands to help the curators when they're hanging and if somebody wants to learn about that we would love to invite them so basically we tasked every department with coming up with at least one project or one ongoing um, responsibility that they would let people from outside their department be part of and you know we publish it on our intranet, and you apply for it, and then and of course you're paid for your time uh, working on it. And so, in a small organization, this is what we think will both, you know, help us to get extra hands on things that we need help with. But really, it was intended largely to help the staff be able to grow in areas that might be outside of where they're working now, so they stay engaged. Um, with the dolly. I'm going to flip that and make this a wake up call and tell me if you agree with this for for the audience and the students as they get moving in their career. This is an an organization or leader I will say an organization led initiative, but not all organizations have this type of initiative. And it relates to what Kathy mentioned early on. You have to have this foresight to know maybe what you need to build the skills or experiences you need to build. So maybe when you're within an organization and you are keeping an eye open of the different knowledges and the projects and the people that are interesting that you want to work with or for, maybe even in your organization, you have to pitch to your boss to say, I want to grow and get this other experience. And, other. and maybe that will craft your uh, career, add a, another skill set, add an experience so you can craft your journey in your your professional life. So. It's a different way of getting experience instead of just changing jobs, but maybe even within a company, you can build a big toolkit of experiences that allow you to maneuver this, this bigger career journey. Would you agree with that, Kathy? Very much so. And I think even if a company doesn't have a program like that, I mean, some of the other companies I worked for had things like mentorship programs where I remember when I was at Fannie Mae, um, I had, you know, was assigned a mentor based on some skills. I was looking like I applied for this program and I was looking to to grow in this area and I would meet with her 
for like a lunch or something like that. And those programs are great, but you're really just kind of interviewing somebody and, and, you know, hearing good advice, but you're not like working on things for that person or, or on those skills. So that's what I liked about our program. And I'll tell you when I first got to the Dali, um, a young, you know, kind of two years into her career, um, person came to me who was not in my department and said that all they wanted to do was work in marketing. And if, you know, and that they were in a different department at the time, if a position opened, they'd love to work in, in marketing, but that if not in the meantime, could she help out with things? And I kind of ran this by, you know, other people, my colleagues and my, and my boss to say like, am I allowed to just act? like, if that's okay with you all, I would love it. I mean, why wouldn't I want an extra hand? She was voluntarily offering her time because she wanted to learn. And she, I mean, and so that was incredible. That took, you know, guts on her part to come to me. I think it was honestly like my second day there, maybe. <laughs> I was like, whoa. But um, but uh, she ended up working for me for like five years. We did have a position open up um, and, you know, she she and I are still really good friends and I still provide her with advice and things like that sometimes on her career. And so um, I was always like really, I really admired that she was able, that she had the idea to do that and um, it worked out for her. We can start seeing how those who go the extra mile, who are willing to sacrifice, put themselves out there, can, the hungry ones can get those opportunities. I'd like to turn the floor over to questions that the audience may have for Kathy. Don't be shy. Um, I'll start. I have a question um, regarding um, like marketing and advertisement for the Dolly. Like, what's your large scale and like small scale approach? Like, um, meaning like uh, for like the St. Petersburg, Tampa Bay area. Do you um, like how do you advertise towards them and then like for tourism and stuff like that? How do you get out to people uh, like when they come to the area to come and see the Dolly to make okay, it? Wonder that is a area? great question. And I'll tell you, based on our budget, uh, we have a finite budget. And so we focus largely on the area, but that doesn't mean that we don't hit tourists. So we rely on Visit St. Pete Clearwater, who has a very large budget in comparison to ours to get the tourists to the area. And then when they're here, we hit them with particular types of media. So we have, we did, originally when I got to the museum, I did test a lot of different strategies on trying to reach tourists. But we, you know, in advertising, it's all about mass and we couldn't with the dollars that we had reach enough of the people to really um, make an impact. So we have that kind of really two pronged strategy tourists when we, we call them in market tourists. So that those there's a various levels of pre market tourists. Those are there's pre market tourists who have already booked their trip here, but they haven't arrived yet. There's pre market tourists who are thinking about visiting the area and there's pre-market tourists who haven't even thought about the area. All three of those pre-market tourists, we rely largely on Visit St. Pete Clearwater. The city of St. Pete also has some marketing budget. So we rely on them to get them to the area and they get uh, plenty. <laughs> they get, you know, the, the St. Pete Clearwater area, something like 15 million tourists a year and Tampa, Tampa has something like, I, I think maybe close to double. So there's plenty of people for us us to market to once they're here. And once they're here, we have those in market tourists are already here, and we do a variety of different you know media, a lot of digital these days, um, you know various geofencing and various you know social media you know promoted things, and um, obviously still some print and some uh, outdoor. Uh, periodically, we might do some radio. Um, when I first got to the museum, we were doing a lot of TV. That was more for locals. So locally, we have completely different strategies. A lot of the same media, but they're you know just targeted differently, and they might be getting really different messages over the years, depending on the exhibit. But largely, tourists we've found are most interested in Dali. Um, locals 
want an exhibit because they want to, you know, they need something new. So these are all, you know, we're talking about some of this is media strategy. Some of this is kind of your positioning and, and then it gets into the creative. But, um, you know, it all harkens back to kind of like understanding who you are and understanding uh, your market. And that is all related to research and then trying different things and studying those things and seeing what works best and then just uh, optimizing those as you go. That's a great Perfect. question. I'd like to highlight that these are the same tools that we're applying in our scalability and student consultant design. And what Kathy mentioned was the journey of someone becoming aware of the DALI to probably eventually coming and visiting and spending their money at the DALI. And that's a tool that we learn in our student consulting, but also embedded in the uh, scalability class. What other questions do you have for Kathy? That was excellent. Uh, hi, I have a question. Um, so when it comes to like introducing new exhibits, what is the creative process from like gathering a bunch of ideas to kind of like finalizing on one idea? That is an excellent question. So it starts largely with the curatorial team, but others obviously can have ideas and we welcome any idea. Um, mostly our, our strategy is around educating people about Dali. So we are focused on doing things that were kind of in his sphere of influence, either people he worked with and collaborated with, people he admired like Picasso, people that admired him like Warhol, um, you know, and or Spanish artists. So there's kind of some mm, very loose, but guardrails, because like I said, Dali was kind of into so many different things that it gives us a lot of leeway. So there's just, you know, an opportunity for anybody to have an idea. And a lot of times the curatorial team are interested in investigating and researching, say, a relationship between Dali and this artist or a particular artist that maybe didn't have any relationship with or, you know, with Dali, but could have, there might have been some ties, like, you know, just like any, an idea comes from anywhere, right? So a curator, you know, might have an idea that, you know, oh, you know, what would be really interesting is um, this particular artist I saw a lot about, but, you know, they didn't really have a tie to Dali, but this person worked with them and I think it'd be interesting to investigate. So we do a lot of research and so the curators are interested in researching. And so that's typically what kind of charges them. Um, also, you know, where you look, you're looking at the timelines and when can we do an exhibit and we have different strategies about kind of blockbusters and when they're placed and, um, but I, I mean, I think it all, stems to curiosity. So it's about being curious about a topic and wanting to research it. They do a little bit of research about it and come up with something that's called a precise, which is, you know, just the kind of summary about what this exhibit would explore. And then, you know, if it look, you do a little more research to determine if that's feasible, what kind of artworks would you show in it? What kind of artists would it be, artists or artists? And, and then ultimately you start talking to different um, museums that you might be able to borrow works for. Does that look realistic and feasible? Um, so that's kind of the, the um, you know, pattern of what happens, but it also, you know, could be like a topic, something, um, not an artist or artists, but a topic that Dali was really interested in. And, you know, you want to explore that more. So how do you tell that story? Exhibits are really all about storytelling. So it is, yeah, I think, I think the curiosity of, of wanting to find the answers to like what, what happened here and, and what is this story to tell? and then kind of weaving it all together. Did that answer your question? Oh, yes, it answered it. Okay. Thank you. I kind of forgot what the question was. I started rambling a little bit about the process of <laughs> exhibition creation, but uh, hopefully I, I got you there. 
That's, that was a wonderful question because that even showed the process of of innovation, the new exhibit or process of creation, creation and creating the exhibit, which is fundamental to what we learn in the creativity and innovation uh, course, right? Creative self, the creative uh, environment, the creative process and the, the creative products and services. Wonderful. The last question that I would like to ask you, and we're so grateful for having you here. If you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you give her? Um, I didn't make any really bad like hair decisions ever in my life or anything, so I don't have um, those kinds of regrets. I don't know. Actually, I really hate the, like to think about regrets because I do think that everything is a learning experience and if I hadn't you know made certain mistakes or certain choices I wouldn't be where I am and I'm really lucky and I'm really happy both in my professional and personal life so um you know I I think I I I don't know, you know, what advice I would give myself other than to, you know, I get, I mean, I guess like we've talked about before being introspective is good, like really knowing yourself. I, I've always had maybe too much confidence. So I don't know. I, I've always kind of known who felt like I knew who I was. And so that's, it, you know, and then that that evolves and what you want changes and, and whatnot, but kind of having a really good idea of who you are and then like what's going to make you happy is is really important and uh, and not being afraid to take some risks um, and and not being also maybe afraid to stay in a job a little longer you know i do think that people are jumping around jumping ship a lot these days and i think there are things you can learn even when you're in an environment that isn't ideal for you um i'm not saying stay in a job you're miserable in but you know i think like i said earlier too you can learn a lot from from leaders that aren't you know stellar um, so you can learn a lot from colleagues and things in places that you're not necessarily super happy in either. Again, I never stayed anywhere that I was miserable in. So, um, you know, but I, again, it, it just, I, it, you want to be happy and you spend all this time, you know, at your job and caring, you, you want to care about what you do. So I think that is really important. I definitely learned those lessons along the way. But again, I, I wouldn't, I definitely don't have regrets. And I, that wasn't your question anyway. You said, well, what advice would I give myself? So the advice would be to like kind of, you know, stay on track with who you are and what's important to you and um, go for that. And, you know, I, I was, I was lucky that like, I wasn't ever super motivated by money. It wasn't about like, I want to make this much money or I want to be at this certain position. So I've got to go like, you know, to these certain steps. It, it was always to me about being happy. Um, and that didn't mean just your stereotypical work-life balance because I've had jobs where I had to work a lot of hours, but I was happy doing it. So it, it I mean, but work-life balance is obviously important too. So I, I think that's the advice. Know who you are, know what you want, and go for it. Kathy, in my view, you make leadership look easy, and it's not. You make being uh, the operations officer look easy, it's not. You make being a leader who brings humanistic values to an organization look easy, and it's not. In our society where we're missing that human element. So thank you for being a beacon of light, a beacon of hope, uh, for lighting that torch so others can follow. Thank you for your time here. And let's give Kathy a big round of applause with our mics off. We will be in touch. Is there a way that our students could either reach out to you or how to get in contact? And I'll give you the last word. Absolutely. And thank you all for your time. This was an honor and um, I always love working with you. And yeah, I mean, anyone can email me. I, that is 
definitely one of my pillars. I am open to, you know, anything, uh, any questions or, you know, um, any further discussion. So uh, you can email me um, and I can give my email now or you can you can give it out to your students and um, anytime I'm here. That's an open invitation to network with Kathy and a COO, which you don't often have opportunity to do in your daily life. So that's why we're here building this community on the Open Educator. Thank you again, and we'll be in touch soon, Kathy. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone.